if we want to build true awareness, one email is not going to do it. I don't think that changing that marketing mindset in an organization is as quick as just saying, just do it. If you're going to talk about marketing, talk about marketing. If you're going to talk about communications, talk about communications. So don't just put it together into a buzzword that generally means nothing. And it is an absolute game changer. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Marketing for Learning podcast. I've got a very, very special episode for you today because I'm not on my own and I'm not with Ash. I am with the wonderful Emma Hunter from Capgemini. And today we're going to be talking about the importance of um, proactive marketing in L&D rather than that reactive that we all seem to fall into the bucket of, don't we, Emma? So, oh, Emma, yeah. hi. Welcome Hello. to the Marketing for Learning podcast. Thank you for having me. I am so excited. I do think. And I'm really sorry for Paula when she listens to this, because I know you two have got a bit of a war on. Oh, I have. think you might be our biggest fan. <laughs> 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 I've seen inside Cap Gemini. I've you seen have. how much you share the Marketing for Learning podcast with all of your Spreading pineapples your far and wide, Hannah. Yeah. It was one of your colleagues that told me that pineapples are really, really like negatively looked upon in, I think it was Brazil. I was I like, know. Oh, that's not great. <laughs> Who'd have thought they're the best ones ever? <laughs> so let's, we've got to be careful not to waffle a lot. Emma and I, I are cut from the same cloth, guys. We have hilarious conversations weekly. Um, we so do. we'll try to keep it uh, on track for you today. So um, tell us a little bit about you and your experience. All right. Um, yeah, so I am currently uh, what's called the head of the Creative Centre of Competence called Capgemini Global Learning and Development, which is possibly the longest job title I've ever I'd had. Say, that's nice yeah. and snappy. <laughs> <laughs> but if breaking it down, it means that I'm responsible for both the design and the marketing of all of the global learning and development products in Capgemini. Now, you might have heard of Capgemini and some people might not have. I know that you didn't before we started working together, Han. No. But it's a massive global organisation. And once you've heard of the name, you see it everywhere. Um, but even at such a big corporate organisation, we have the same struggles as everybody else. Um, and it it's so real when we look at that corporate environment. But I'm actually a marketeer through and through. Um, I first heard about Maslow and his lovely hierarchy of needs back in the middle of the 1990s and I've been working with them ever since you know I um I did a marketing postgraduate career I went through L'Oreal for many many years um you know and I've had that very traditional marketing track and then I fell into into learning probably only a couple of years ago and I had that brain moment of the, that kind of lightning bolt of why why aren't learners or why aren't the learning organizations running it like a marketing organization? I don't get it. Um, and then I discovered you guys and you guys <laughs> were saying exactly the same things as I was. Well, we had the exact same light bulb moment, but we were yeah. we were in the marketing teams of learning tech organizations and selling the tech and going, well, yeah, our clients are saying, oh, well, this isn't quite right or we're not getting enough engagement. Well, yeah, the tech's not going to solve that problem. No, it's never going to solve that problem. Yeah. I, I, I'm eternally grateful for Ash just going, hey, I'm going to fix this and make him mess because that's why we're here today. That's why we're having this conversation. But Phenomenal. as a marketer, it seems such an obvious problem, doesn't it? It is so obvious and it's staring you in the face. Mm -hmm. And you look at the work that I was doing in L'Oreal <laughs> so many years ago. But everything that they do is planned out, it's proactive, it's well thought of, and it's driven in this kind of campaign approach that's just drip threat fed throughout the year. And it doesn't matter whether it's like a promotion of a one particular product or if it's the whole brand or whatever it is, you think about it, you plan it, you act on it, and then you analyze the data to feed back into the promotion for the next time. And then you go into like learning environments and all of a sudden people are saying, oh, um, hang on a minute, we've got this launch that's going out next week, let's send an email. And you just think, <laughs> how could that be so different? You know, And it's it's worse than just sending an email, isn't it? It's not just it 
a good email. You're sending a, there's a new course on the LMS. Like it's not engaging. It's not getting Never. anyone's attention. So L&D, and I think there has been a change. And obviously with your role, you're probably like a poster child because you do make sure that oh, all of your, well, you do, your learning interventions are properly marketed. And we'll touch on that after. But there is a, there's a shift. I know yeah. L&Ders are thinking more about how we communicate but it's still quite reactive isn't it it's massively reactive and it's so interesting to see you know I I'm constantly challenging uh, my team and our organization um I have the uh can you just I hate the can you just (laughs) or as as somebody in our team calls it the JFDIs they just do it (laughs) Um, you know, it's these kind of reactive moments and, and they detract from all of the positive stuff that you could be doing if you adapted a positive marketing mindset or, or sorry, a proactive marketing mindset. Yeah. So if you look at the reactive stuff, you know, that is the the traditional, okay, we've got a product coming out. How do we quickly get that out? And you're not really thinking about that strategy. You're not thinking about that long-term approach of saying, actually, if we want to build true awareness, one email is not going to do it. You know, so how do we build these really proactive campaigns? And and really importantly, how do we tie that into the business ambitions of what the business wants to achieve? But also, how do you make sure that you're drip feeding that constant kind of awareness campaigns with the employees to make sure that you're hitting those moments that matter for them. Yeah. Because unless you link it into a moment that matter, it's never going to resonate. It's never going to drive any awareness or impact. So you can't do that if you're just constantly reacting to the business yeah. with a with a can you just request. And if we flip it on the head, because I know a lot of L and Ds are like, well, we're serving the business, and yes, we need to cater to our audience's needs, but we need to cater to the business first. I genuinely. We're taking compliance training out of this. Cannot think of a single learning intervention that a business would want someone to just go, yep, done it, tick box, goodbye. Learning is long-term. Learning is about a behavioral change. It's about performance change. It's about acquiring new skills. And we all know, as people in learning, that doesn't happen overnight. So why do we think marketing on such a like ad hoc, quick, send out an email, hope for the best basis works. And I genuinely believe, and I know I've spoken to you and your team at length about this, the solution to that problem is talking about marketing from the start. Absolutely. Very, very start. So I know you work with a lot of people that have got a lot of experience in L&D. How did you handle that? How? Because you were already doing that before I rocked up. So how did you handle changing that mindset? That's been a massive change of mindset over a very long time. And to be honest, I think we're still going through that. And I think we will still be going through it in five years time. I don't think that changing that marketing mindset in an organization is as quick as just saying, just do it. You know, mm-hmm. um, when I joined, our, we didn't have a, a marketing department we had a Marcoms department Mm -hmm. and I personally, Marcoms is a bit of a bugbear to me um, because if you're going to talk about marketing, talk about marketing. If you're going to talk about communications, talk about communications. So don't just put it together into a buzzword that generally means nothing. Okay. (laughs) They're two such different things. They are two such different things. And for me, the Marcoms approach, we were just email monkeys. (laughs) <laughs> That's all we were, you know, it was that reactive, let's send out another email. Oh, you want another email? Ping, there you go, have another one. Um, and that's all we were doing. And from the get-go, it was about trying to change a mindset in from the leadership team downwards yeah. by saying, actually, if you integrate that marketing thinking and a marketeer right from that define and discover moment of a project, then we are able to build up that strategy rather than chasing our tails right at the end, trying to work it out, whatever it is you're trying to communicate and get something out. And by getting people to realize, by incorporating marketing right from that define and discover moment of a product development cycle, 
we're able to build out what does it mean for the personas? What does it mean for the strategy? How can we build up a better visual identity? How can we build up a, you know, a really good marketing campaign that we can start building awareness with teasers and then with the launch campaign and then going forward with aligning with group comms of all people, you know? Um, and as soon as the organization started to see what it meant if we included marketing earlier, it's like a light bulb moment for them because all of a sudden they're starting to see actually we can be more proactive and we can come out with better solutions. Um, and so all of a sudden we've gone into this thing where we've built out from a, a very small comms team into quite a large marketing function now mm -hmm. where we have one marketeer specifically looking after a group of almost a skills portfolio and that person is becoming an expert in that skills portfolio. That person is being part of the project team right from the get go. And it is an absolute game changer. And if you look at some of the, you know, the projects that we're working on with you, mm. you can see how that interaction really does work when you're working with the LX designers and you're working with the, you know, the project managers at the same time, you've got this core team where everybody's an expert and everybody's contributing right from the get-go. And that's super exciting. Absolutely. And I think from my personal experience working on some of those projects with you guys, it's quite it's not a difficult task to educate people on why mm. it's important. So I'm thinking of one particular conversation with one of your project leads and a project manager and a member of your marketing team. They're like, oh, but we need to send more emails. I was like, we don't. The, and I, I explained, well, actually, no, these are instead of the emails because you've got a huge audience. Mm. They get too many emails already. Let's not add to the noise. We save the emails for the times that it needs to be an email. Emails mm -hmm. absolutely a really valued part of any marketing, let alone marketing for learning with targeting employees. But there was so much other stuff. And it was the educational piece of, this isn't just fun stuff. This isn't just fluffy stuff. Um, the project I'm thinking on with we're creating a video is still in progress uh, process. That video is not just to look pretty and go, hey, look, we created a video. It's an actual marketing asset that's gonna make people move, make mm -hmm. people do something. And as soon as that was explained, the request for, oh, can we just send out an email? Can we just send out this? Can we just, like you said, can we just can yeah. we just? seem to have really slowed down yeah but it's having the confidence and I wonder obviously now you have a big marketing team mm -hmm. uh, and like I've said many times on the podcast I live in a dream world where one day all L&D teams will at least have one marketer to help with that marketing piece what was it like when it was back at the Marcom stage how was that educational piece because I think a lot of people will be sat here listening and thinking that sounds like a dream, but I'm never going to get there. Yeah, it was really tough. And and again, you know, I mean, I'd say that the challenges we've got today are probably still the challenges we had then. Mm -hmm. But it's about that commitment from the get-go to push back, to challenge, and to do things better. You know, just as you said then, even though we've gone through this transformation journey over the last couple of years about really reacting as a, as a marketing department, we're still getting challenged today about, can you just send an email? You know, and I said in five years time, we're still going to be challenged of can you just send an email because it's quick, it's easy and it's comfortable. So we still have those challenges, but but being able to turn around and say, I truly believe this is the best thing for the organization. Just let me try it. Let me fail gloriously or succeed gloriously. And having the organization's trust to do something a little bit different was all that it took. Um, you know, take one example, just take one project, one product and say, if I'm just going to try it on this one, what could I do with it? And it's when people start to seeing the success that all of a sudden they want it more. Yeah. Um, so start small, but think big. And it comes back to that again, that proactive marketing. Um, for me, I am applying proactive marketing every day. Mm -hmm. So I am not just thinking about that one product or that portfolio or what's going on this year or what's going on with our learning brand in my head I also have that massive plan of that marketing for learning strategy 
of in five years time, what could we be doing if? And that's the really exciting bit. And that, to be honest, was the moment of, you know, in those Marcoms times when I was in that team and trying to make change, being able to find somebody like you guys who were saying the same things as I was is absolutely crucial for an organization because I was able to say, this isn't just me. This isn't just me saying that this is what you want to do. Listen, listen to Ashley, listen to Hannah. This is what's going around here. And this is significant change. And having somebody else to be able to get your back and say that was probably one of the biggest moments where I was able to say, we're going to do this, you know, and you've got the confidence because you've got this little pineapple sitting on your shoulder saying you can. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and I think also it's important because obviously, yes, we do work together now and we've worked together on projects. You'd done a lot of that with just the podcast, hadn't you? You were just sending out episodes and sending out pieces of work that we'd done to say, hey, look, like this is a change. This is a movement. This is something that's happening that's and good. we need to be doing it. So yeah, it's not a case of, oh, you got to work with us. And then, because I, again, I know a lot of people perhaps don't have the budget. They don't have the capacity, mm -hmm. things like that. That's fine. It's like you said, it's that determination of this Purely is the right that. thing to do. And and I always say, even now, because I'm still sharing podcasts, I'm still telling people to go and listen to your podcast. I was talking to somebody just the other day from, from outside of the organization who had been in basically had met somebody within our team at a learning event and that person on our team said oh you need to speak to Emma and I had this call with this guy and the first thing I said to him was you've got to listen to these podcasts because it will change your game <laughs> and it does but it's but I always say the same thing you've got to start at episode one and work your way through because oh, yeah. it's a journey and and you know for me it was I've been working on it for about five months before I'd even discovered marketing for learning podcasts and it was someone in my team who came back from a learning conference and just went somebody was mentioning these podcasts and I just wondered if you might want to check it out and I listened to your first one about awareness problem and I was like that's what I've been saying for the last five months you know <laughs> um and so like you said it, it's it's that pure determination to make a change and it doesn't matter how big or small that change is. It's just making that positive change. And you can't do that by constantly responding to the can you just requests. Yeah. Um, because if you're doing that, you're being reactive. You're being a comms person. And I have no problem with comms people at all because what they do is absolutely crucial. But if you want to really drive impact, if you want to drive awareness, let alone engagement, Let's start off with the strategy and really think about that long term of how are you embedding those moments that matter into your employees and emails aren't going to cut it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I often say to my team, like if you if you're writing an email, I will quite ha happily send it back to them and say, I've got to the first two sentences and I've turned off. Do it again. You know, because unless I'm thinking as an employee and I'm reading those emails, for me, if it if it doesn't hook me straight away, I don't care what the rest of it work. says. I'm not going to approve that email and it's not going to go out. Yeah. So how can you make things shorter? How can you make it more impactful? But but most importantly, how can you decide when is an email the right thing to do versus what you were saying of a video or a post or anything else that you could possibly do in the organization based on your tactics and your strategy? Yeah. And we've spoken a lot on the podcast, and I know we definitely use it, and you use it at Capgemini, of the age model. So we've got oh, yeah. awareness, desire, interest, action, loyalty. We've got that whole journey. And reactive marketing sits in the action stage, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. They want to send out one email and get thousands upon thousands, especially in your case. Um, for those <laughs> yeah. of you that don't know, I think what's there over 300,000 employees at Capgemini now. Like That's right. yeah. Emma's got a big old target audience. So they're looking at just that action stage, aren't they? I want to send an email and I want people to go do the learning. Yeah. Proactive marketing is obviously much more about that entire journey, mm -hmm. raising the awareness, piquing the interest, mm -hmm. making people want to get involved. Was that a challenge, getting people to realise that not every single piece of comms or marketing that goes out needs to be 
hey, go to the LMS right now? <laughs> it's still a challenge. And I think it will continue to be a challenge for all the reasons we've mentioned, you know, people want results right now. Um, and they don't necessarily see that those awareness building or loyalty creating campaigns or tactics are going to make big change because it falls down into the proactive marketing yeah. and people aren't used to that. Um, you know, if you look at McDonald's, I know you love talking about McDonald's. <laughs> Um, I know you're going out for dinner later, but it, it probably won't Not be McDonald's. <laughs> We're talking about McDonald's for a bit. But if you look at McDonald's and what they do, right? So they have promotions on their products. And their products are the actions, the, the come and get me, come and buy me, you want to eat me. Then they also have the desire stuff and the, the awareness and the interest things. Because it's like the, the Monopoly campaign that they did, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, my son, any time we drove past, past to McDonald's, Mom, can we go into McDonald's and can we go and get a Diet Coke so that I can get another, you know, Monopoly card or whatever? Actually, it wasn't a Diet Coke. What, my, who am I kidding? It was McFlurry. <laughs> I was literally like, wait, a Diet yeah. Coke? That's very and it had to be a full-size McFlurry because the little McFlurries don't have them on, you know? So so it's like, how are they building that, that, that desire and that loyalty by doing things that they're not about? a particular product that's about just come and have fun in our stores yeah and then on top of that you have the overarching branding campaigns you know the the waggle of the eyebrows yeah. or the little whistle or whatever it is where you hear something you see something and it resonates in your head and that's all about that awareness and interest level so if you look at someone like mcdonald's that's applying the awareness and interest campaigns they have loyalty and desire campaigns and they have the action-based tactics where they, you know, the typical come and buy a Big Mac. That's what we need to be applying for an, a learning organization. Yeah. And that's how you can really drive change and, and build impact when it comes to a brand, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I love that example. I often talk about Apple and yeah. the difference between, hey, look, here's the shiny new iPhone. You must go buy it now. And the people in store even that are like, mm -hmm. it won't crack if you drop it because it's made out of titanium don't understand that but hey hi um but they've got all those really tactical come and buy me i am yep, yep. selling you this product but they've got most of their marketing is brand marketing it's yep. the status of having an apple device it's the status of having an iphone L D need to adopt that mindset if they want Massively. real impact it's about balance it yep. really is about balance and and you can't just constantly push learning on people you know I know you've said it before I know I've said it before but people don't want to learn we are so busy mm -hmm. you know so how do we make people want to learn and we can't do that by building pathways where we're wanting people to go through something really quickly and mark something as complete we have to see that people see the benefit for it and that they can feel like that they're, they're contributing to that continual learning culture yeah. you know if you look at what we need to be doing as an organization, it's not just based around trying to get those completions, but it is about that competencies, but also driving that learning culture where we're enabling our employees to learn. And fundamentally, it's like it's like your own project, you, you know, yeah. if you were going to come, come up with a, a project to develop yourself, the first thing you want to do is look at your, your areas of, of development that you need to work on and go and develop them. But in an organization where they're like, no, you must churn out everything as fast as you can, as much as you can, without spending that time to learn. So how do we change that mindset? And you're never going to change that mindset unless you have these brilliant campaigns around learning that makes it attractive. Yeah. And I think as well, something I've been thinking about quite a lot recently is the marketing mindset helps with learning transfer. It helps with yeah. that long term behavioral change because I don't know about you or anyone listening. If you think about the last time you bought something that was expensive, and um, mm -hmm. let's be honest, time is more important to people than money these days. Yeah. And we are asking a lot of our audience, asking them to give up their time to come and do our learning, the thing that we want them to do. So they're spending a lot of money with us, so to speak. Mm -hmm. If you recently bought, I don't know, I recently bought an iPad. Ash recently bought me an iPad. Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> but nice. I have had a lot of emails and um, marketing 
from Apple being like, you can do this with your iPad. You can do that. Have you looked at this? Have you activated that? They're keeping me engaged. They're making me remember, hey, I've got this shiny new toy that I want to play with. They're keeping me hooked. Mm -hmm. We can do that in learning too. That is the, hey, you completed this program. Have you thought about this? But there's more. Have you applied this? What about that? Share your experience. Novel idea. Get them to do the marketing for you. Share their experience. (laughs) You've got user-generated content. It works. And marketing does straddle. And I think that's a big mindset that I would like to see change in L&D. Marketing straddles the entire learning process. It is not a bolt-on at the end. And if you stop thinking of it as a bolt-on, that's when you're going to get the big impact change. Massively. And I think if there's one thing that anybody can remember is if somebody comes to you with a can you just, it needs to flick a switch in your head that you know that that is a reactive request. Yeah. So what else can you do instead? You know, and and that's going to be the biggest change that anybody could make. It's something so simple. But can you just send an email? Can you just go and do this for me? Can you just write a deck? All of that stuff has to stop. And we've got to start approaching it with how can we affect change with our employees right from the get-go based on building awareness, going through the interest, desire, action, loyalty. And it's as simple as that. Absolutely. So we've spoken a lot about how it's going to make a change. Oh, yeah. Can you share any of your big wins with us? Because I know you've done, as you said, you've been on this process for a couple of years now, and I know you've had some great impact with some of the stuff you've done at Capgemini. So can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, massively. So it's amazing. It's been such a brilliant journey, you know, and I I, I look at this with pride and with a, a lot of fondness. But, you know, I go back a couple of years and it was full of the can you justs. We were being excluded out of the product development process and we were being put in right at the end with a, right, we need a comms plan, we need emails, we need all of this stuff. And you've got to spend, you know, what some people have spent three or six months developing and getting set in their heads. You've got to spend that in like a week to understand everything that they're going through to come up with one email that's not even going to make any difference anyway. You know, so it was it was so demotivating. And then you turn that around to where we are today. And we are a massive technology company. You know, we are currently going through probably one of the biggest transformations our industry has ever seen when it comes to generative AI. And I know that you guys have spoken about generative AI and learning. I I have my opinions on that and I am going to share share those with you one day. (laughs) But I know that, you know, for generative AI, for our company, it is absolutely massive. Um, And we're on the precipice of something huge. So how do we upskill and reskill our organization into that is one of the biggest priorities we have right now. But it also is one of those ones where we've had to react so quickly to such a fundamental change. So straight away, we had to think about creating this almost this acceleration team where we've got this, you know, our project lead, our project manager, our marketeer brilliantly in there and our LX designers creating this thing together. And they've been on a journey together. And it's been great because, of course, we got you on board. Um, I wanted to make sure it was done properly, you know. Yeah, and just adding in there, that was a reactive thing that your business had to do. Yeah. Yeah. Marketing was still proactive. Yes, absolutely. We still, don't be wrong, there was a little bit of push and pull on oh, how yeah. quickly we could get stuff done. And I think what we bartered, we got ourselves like an extra two or three weeks uh, to make sure our marketing was ready. And we are still creating marketing assets. I say we, the royal we, it's all your team now, are still creating the assets that are going out But the plan, the strategy, it was proactive. We know what we're doing and it's working. So as much as the product might be reactive, that doesn't mean your marketing for learning has to be. It was right from the get-go, right from the identification that we have a need. And it didn't matter that we had a need that had to be turned around so quickly. Like you said, it was utterly reactive from the the absolute instance of saying we are going to set up a team marketing was in there marketing went through that process together and that enabled us to have that proactive approach 
we were able to learn about the challenges in the organization, the reasons why we're doing it, how are our personas going to be linking into this? What can we do to really create that interesting hook? But also, you know, we were lucky. This is one of our top priorities. And we, we had budget that we could say, right, I want to make sure I'm doing this right. And I'm going to get you on board. Hmm. Um, so that we could really bring in that, that strategic mindset that we needed. But even if we didn't, that all of that foundation was still in place. You know, having that person right from the get-go and being able to sit with that project team to understand how this process flow was working. But also, when they're in the stage of developing the product and doing the design and build, the marketeer can be sitting there designing and building their strategy. Mm-hmm. And that is the most crucial thing because it meant that by the time we got to two or three weeks before launch, instead of doing the typical traditional thing that we would do a couple of years ago, where the project team would come to us and go, right, we're almost ready to launch go do your stuff and we'd sit there going what what the hell is this you know i've got no idea all the way through that development process we were developing our own strategy yeah. and that meant that we were ready we were prepared and it's been showing in the figures you know yeah. and that's the most exciting thing and and i know or i hope she's going to listen but you know the person on our team who's been working on this i am like beyond proud i am bursting with pride yeah. with the the results that she's seeing because of the marketing that we're adapting and because of this this proactive mindset of instead of just sending one email which we know was going to be the solution at yep. one point <laughs> instead of doing that we're able to really drive big change yeah and, and seeing where that's going to go next is exciting and talking kind of on behalf of the person in your team I don't really mm. want to do that but I'm going to say it I know having the agreed marketing strategy, so we got buy-in from the whole project team on that marketing strategy, it has enabled her to push back on the can you just. Massively. It's not in the plan. It's not in part of the strategy. Why? Why? And I've said to her, absolutely, there might be, especially, like you said, it's Gen AI. This Mm -hmm. thing's changing massively as the months go on might be a case of having to deviate and edit and tweak the strategy but it needs to be a real sound case of why we do that not for a can you just because so and so wants an extra email that's not going to cut it that's not in the strategy so I think that's also another vote for the proactive stuff having your plan having everyone go yep this is what we're doing and then trusting it and -hmm. like you said it's showing in the figures like I'm blown away by how well it's worked. And I've been doing this marketing for learning thing quite a while now. It's working really, really well. And it's working so much better than an ad hoc email would have ever worked. Massively. And I think being able to, like you said, being able to revisit that strategy, it's not saying the strategy isn't going to change or evolve, but it's having that backbone of a project that you can keep on revisiting and thinking, you know, okay, we now have this need. How does that fit into the strategy? How am I going to play that? Um, it just helps you to to organize your thoughts and organize your actions in a way that's going to make a change mm-hmm. versus that constant chasing your own t- tail or or like, a, you know, a hamster constantly going around in a wheel, just said pinging out email after email after email without any real result. Um, you know, the, the backbone of that strategy is the thing that's going to drive that campaign forward. And seeing the results and the impact that it's having so far um, is massive. And, and, you know, yes, part of that is we've got a great product. Part of that is it is, you know, one of the biggest priorities in the group. But so much of that wouldn't be there if we hadn't put the backbone of that strategy and that marketing campaign in place. Because otherwise, how do people know about it? You know, how do we drive that awareness and that interest? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think actually just like reflecting on it while we're talking now I almost feel like the proactive marketing was even more important because it was a reactive product like project because don't get me wrong I've seen the outputs it's all incredible you've got a wonderful team there it's working really well and like you said you've got a great product (laughs) but people can start feeling itchy and it's like oh no we needed to do this yesterday so and it, the panic and that panic will manifest and it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger and then mm-hmm. like you said you end up with even more emails and you end up on like a, a hamster's wheel 
but having the proactive marketing say no we're trusting the process and almost the marketing being that calm presence of no we're doing this and we're doing this right and we're doing it properly has put other people at ease as well yeah, it's definitely it's been a real like you said a backbone it's been a support for that whole project to say hey look and now we're what a month or so in aren't we yep now we're like hey look at the data told you it was gonna work <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got even more trust now because it's working. And like you said, that's an absolute credit to the marketer and your team that's leading the charge there. Massively. And I think that that's the, you know, coming back full circle, that's the exciting thing about this is because you've got that success case. You know, we've got this one instance now where we're able to say, see, we told you so. And that goes back into the the beginning you know, when we're talking about that mindset change in the organization, by knowing that this works and now having the figures that back that up enables us to carry on doing it time and time and time again. And as I said at the beginning, you know, this is not, it's not an easy process, but it's about having that commitment and celebrating those small wins to drive the mindset change of the organization. And it only starts just with that commitment and that belief that you can make a change. Doesn't yeah, matter how you, big or small it is. No. And you need to have the right people around you. We are like I'm we're lucky, aren't we? Very I'm lucky. definitely lucky with doing what I do. Yeah. But you're lucky you've got a great leadership team and a, like people that trust in you. But we can all run experiments and try to do something marginally better. Even if that is writing an email in a more effective way putting on your marketer's hat, writing that email better and then going, hey, look, I did this different and it worked. So then maybe next time you can do an email and a video or and a social post and gradually build up to that point of, hey, look, no, we're actually going to do a full-blown marketing campaign here because we know it works. I agree. It's having the evidence and running those experiments and having the confidence to do it as well. Oh, massively. You know, I, as I've said it before, but fail gloriously. You know, and you might as well try. What's going to happen if you don't? You know, you're either going to stay stagnant doing nothing or you can make a change, you know, try and see what happens. And if it fails, fine, try something else. We're in a learning organization. You know, we should be the people that are happy to try and fail and learn from it and try again. Um, But, you know, make those small changes because they do start to add up. So start with the you know, changing that mindset away from a Marcoms department into marketing mindset and marketing thinking, responding and challenging the can you justs mm-hmm. and, and that very quick reactive marketing and then start building up your tactics really simply based on what products do you want to promote? How do you want to push your brand and the awareness and the desire of your, your employees to come and do some learning? And then how do you promote that into a strategy that's going to make a change in your organization for your employees? Yeah, that's that's the exciting thing. But it starts it starts small and you just get bigger and bigger. And there's something that you've mentioned a couple of times in this podcast, and I want to get your opinion on how important it is. You mentioned your learning brand. Mm. How important do you think a learning brand is to the success of what you're you're doing at Capgemini? it's everything I think um if you look at an organization any organization at the moment we know that talent is so hard to come by and it's even harder to retain learning is one of the top talent attractors in the industry So knowing that an organization has a learning function that is proactive and that is supporting the employee is something that's not only going to attract your employees to come and, or sorry, potential employees to come and join your organization, it's also going to help keep them there. We do a lot of work on data and we are able to prove with our data that people who learn, we have lower attrition on them. We, so we therefore have higher retention in the right numbers, and we also have higher promotion rates. Those are some amazing stories there. But what's the point of having those amazing stories unless you talk about them? 
So we need to be able to say, actually, do you know what? Cap Gemini is a great place to work. But not only is it a great place to work, it's a great place to work because we support you to grow and develop and be successful to go and get the career that you want, to go and do whatever it is that you want to do. You're never going to do that if you're just talking about a compliance module or if you're talking about going to the LMS to go and take this course or do whatever. These are big topics that help to pull your employees into your learning ecosystem. And you're never going to get that by pushing products. Yeah. So for me, it's that balance again between that push and that pull. And talking about your own learning brand is possibly more important than actually talking about a learning product itself, because it's going to drive your employees to come and discover more. And the one thing, you know, within all of this as well is I, again, I don't talk about our learners. Yeah. Because for me, it's really important that we have employees. Mm -hmm. Um employees i want to talk about not just the people who are actively learning with us but the employees who haven't discovered us yet there aren't very many in capture <laughs> i'm looking at the data this morning and and a lot of people have, have visited our, our lms platform but you know we we know we've got to talk to these people as people and we have to pull on their desires and development is up there with pay with flexibility to work from home, with all of the other benefits that we have, we know that learning is up there. So it's time that we start to celebrate that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not just for Capgemini and your data. It's in all of the reports now, isn't it? That learning is and development opportunities and things like that are just as important as pay, as flexible working and things like that. So like you said, mm. it's, it's time to celebrate that. And we do that through our learning brands. It's the only mm. way we can do that. And like we've said on this podcast many, many times, a brand isn't necessarily a logo or a name or a color scheme. It's what people think of when they think of you. So mm -hmm. take control of that, whether your internal comms lets you have a brand and a logo and all of that or not. You can yeah. still control your learning brand. It's a culture and it's a mindset and it's an ethos that you can get behind and celebrate. Um, and I think that that's the... Yeah, that, that's something to believe in. And if you believe in your learning in your organization, then that means that you believe in your learning brand in an organization. Yeah. So you need to talk about that just as much as you do any other offer that you celebrate. Absolutely. And I think, again, marketers need to be the people that believe in it and champion and brand as much as we're championing our audiences. We need to be the fangirl of the whole team I always say like if you think about a marketer in any organization they're the ones that are raving the most about the product probably in the most believable way let's be honest because sometimes sales you can see straight through it can't you but the marketers love it they're, they're there they're championing the brand oh, they're championing the products they're championing the audience and that's what an l and that wants to adopt marketing for learning needs to start thinking about Totally agree with you. What a wonderful chat, Em. Oh, I knew this was going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can't talk all day as much as we'd like to. We've both got actual work to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am certain that we'll have you back on the podcast again at some point. Um, mm -hmm. Not least to talk about that Gen AI stuff. I do love a little insight Absolutely. here. Emma voice noted me straight away and was like, there's loads of ways you can use Gen AI in learning. I know, um, Ashley, if you're listening to this, <laughs> I am going to come and talk to you about that because it's it's probably the one area where I went, no one <laughs> can disagree with you. And that, that's never happened before. I feel like I'm marginally learning, but there's so much to learn. So we'll definitely have you on to talk about that. Um, and good. I'm sure many other things. But thank you so much for coming on the pod, Em. Thanks for having me. And if anybody else listening wants to get involved, wants to come on an episode, wants to talk to us about anything, please do reach out. We're more than happy to have guests on the podcast. Um, and if you've got any questions, queries for myself or Emma, you can find us both on LinkedIn. Um, and if not, I guess I'll catch you on the next podcast, guys. Bye.